Good morning. So what a moment we're in when so much is unraveling and also so much is still possible if we choose to pursue it. Let's set some critical context for the day. I know Alex mostly covered the rigorous science of climate change. Um, <laughs> this is a chart probably all of you have seen before. Fluctuations in the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere continuing to race upward. I think the latest reading from Mauna Loa is 413 parts per million. What does that number mean, 413 parts per million? Very simply, it means we have never lived on a planet like this. We have created conditions that are way outside the norm for our species, much less others. Conditions we've never survived within, totally uncharted territory. And I've begun to think about this chart as something like an echocardiogram for the Earth, right? An EKG that has spiked way beyond normal range. And that steady rise and fall within a relatively stable range, that's what lets us as human beings live and thrive. And that same relative steadiness and stability of our climate is what has allowed society to take its current shape. So you can think about this particular spike as essential feedback to humanity. This data, as well as the changes playing out across our planet, I think of as feedback from Earth that the way we're doing things isn't working and that another way of being has to emerge and fast. I think the good news is that more and more people are hearing this feedback and we're hearing it in science, but I think we're also hearing it in our gut and in our bones. There's a growing sense that we have to return to conditions that are most conducive for life on this planet, the only planet that we know for sure is conducive to life. So what does that mean? It means aiming for drawdown, the point in time when that concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stops rising and begins to steadily decline. In other words, drawdown is the point when we head back to a healthy heartbeat. And we have got to get there as quickly and as safely and as equitably as possible. So that means slowing emissions, stopping emissions, stabilizing up in uncharted territory. None of that is sufficient. We actually have to turn around and head back the other way. So I think it's worth starting the day thinking about the aspiration of being net climate beneficial, right? Not just a little bit less bad, but actually transformative in a positive way. And I think that goal really matters because goals set our context for action, right? They govern what we reach for and how. And in service of this goal of Drawdown, our uh, organization, Project Drawdown, has been aiming to understand to communicate and ultimately to accelerate the world's very best climate solutions. We've got a global team of researchers and thought leaders who have been scouring humanity's wisdom, not for someday maybe cross your fingers if we're lucky solutions, but the very best practices and technologies that are already in hand. So there are things that are commonly available, at least in some places, economically viable and scientifically valid. We've documented 80 such solutions so far with more underway. And we've assessed the impact each of them can have as part of a system, if scaled over the next three decades. And where data is sufficient, we've also looked at uh, financial analysis. What's the cost to implement? How much money will we spend or save, in most cases save, in operating these solutions over the next 30 years? And they span many sectors. 
not just energy, which can sometimes become such a totalizing conversation in the climate space. And it is, of course, critical, but it's not the whole story. So we try to look at the whole board, at every one of these sectors. And as you can see, we're adding oceans currently. And it also means looking, of course, at solutions that stop sending greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere, but also solutions that bring carbon back home through the ultimate technology of photosynthesis. It turns out that 3.8 billion years of R&D um, is pretty darn effective. What you see here are the solutions ranked by their potential impact on emissions, 2020 to 2050, and this is our most conservative, what we call our plausible scenario. And I think what's interesting is when you look at them all together, you actually see something that looks a lot like nature. It's a diverse mosaic. There are no single silver bullets, but there are footholds of action for every individual and every institution across every aspect of life. And there's a role for super sexy technology, of course, but there's also a role for stewardship and farming and human rights. And it's interesting, I think, that the solutions are as much about dusting off ancient wisdom as they are sort of zipping to the future and the next innovation. It's both. As we know, solutions don't scale themselves, and this is sort of conveniently left out of drawdown. <laughs> um, we need solvers. We need, uh, I heard someone this last week at Climate Reality use the term solutionaries, which I really think is great. Um, we need means of dramatically accelerating implementation and adoption of these solutions. And of course, there are lots of different ways to sort of put our feet on the uh, electric pedal. <laughs> um, we can change the rules with policy and incentives. We can advance technology through innovation, R&D, shift capital, whether philanthropic or investment capital. We can change culture, telling different stories, reshaping our shared ideas, and we can change behavior. Why behavior? It's very simple. There are almost 7.7 .7 billion of us living on this planet, and we eat, we move, we build, we consume, we waste, we produce, um, some of us much, much more than others. So if we weren't doing, if we weren't behaving or misbehaving, we wouldn't have global warming. And if we look at the drawdown solutions through the lens of behavior, which is exactly what the RARE team did, we find that at least 30 of them for at least 30 of them, behavior change is a very critical accelerant. Solutions related to food, plant-rich diets, reducing food waste, using clean cook stoves, composting. Solutions focused on agriculture, how we produce what we eat. Um, we looked at a whole host of regenerative practices like silvopasture, multi-strata agroforestry, but also things like more efficient drip irrigation and nutrient management. Transport and mobility-oriented solutions, electric vehicles, electric bikes, which incidentally are the fastest growing alternative fuel vehicle in the world. Walkable, bikeable cities, mass transit, telepresence to reduce flying. Energy solutions, both those that focus on efficiency, but also small scale generation, everything from smart thermostats to rooftop solar to solar water heaters and micro wind. And then there's a set of solutions that we look at and draw down under the sector we call women and girls. And we call it that because it turns out that there are critical areas where gender equity has positive ripple effects on reducing emissions educating girls, securing access to family planning and high quality voluntary reproductive health care, supporting women smallholder farmers. But beyond that, we are also seeing that the leadership and choices of women and girls are critical in this moment as we try to transform the world that we live in. Climate strikes led by teenage girls collaborating all over the world, entrepreneurship, 
critical decisions about household consumption. And I think this is a theme we'll see crop up throughout the day. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the next decade will be the most pivotal in human history. And that can feel incredibly daunting. And it feels daunting for me many days. And on the days where I sort of want to like hide under the covers and not do this work, I also try to remember that it is a magnificent thing to be alive in a moment that matters as much as this moment does. That creating a livable future is our purpose as a human species alive on Earth in this moment. And that's it, right? Our reason for being is to build a bridge from where we are today to the world that we want to leave for our children and their children and their children and their children. It's what our ancestors did for us, and now it's our turn. So let's seize it. Thank you.